I think we're going to get started. On behalf of the First Fridays Committee and the Ask Department, welcome to First Fridays. I'm Caitlin Marino. Um, welcome back to our regular guests and a special welcome to anyone who's here for the first time. First Fridays is a monthly series of presentations made possible by a generous gift from Governor Elmer Ella Anderson and Mrs. Eleanor Anderson in, for, in honor of former library director, Dr. Edward B. Stanford. The presentations are based on materials in the university libraries, archives, and special collections. This year's theme is We Are Here, Women in the Archives, focusing on female identifying stories. And a reminder that we are streaming and video will be available later on the UMN Library's YouTube channel. Um, today's presentations focus on the Immigration History Research Center archives and the Treader Collection in GLBT Studies. And lunch today is from Pizza Luce. Um, there will be a tour afterwards with Maura Kunin. Is Maura in here? She's over there. So if you want a tour of the caverns, um, she will be the one. We will also be offering tours of the um, children's literature exhibit that's out there. Um, is Mary in here? Mary's over there. So if you'd like a tour of um, the exhibit afterwards, find Mary um, out in the lobby. And if you would like a tour of the caverns, find Maura. Um, all right, so we don't have an announcement from the friends today, so we'll just get started. Our first presentation today is from um, the Immigration History Research Center archives, the International Institute of Minnesota at 100. The Immigration History Research Center archives is happy to present today a guest speaker and researcher, Krista Finstad Hansen. Krista will share about the women, leadership, and service of the International Institute of Minnesota on the occasion of their centennial. Thank you all for being here today. Such a nice crowd. Um, so I need to just quickly say that I am not an uh, archivist from the collections here. I, am, I was invited by Ellen Ainseth, and I've been researching in this collection for five years to tell this 100-year story. I am a U of M alum. I have two teaching licenses and my master's in education. I'm an English teacher and a writer, but I stumbled upon history. So um, luckily, I was employed at the International Institute when my executive director said the 100th anniversary is going to be in 2019. Does anyone want to help? And I raised my hand. I was the only one. <laughs> so <laughs> they were so lucky that I was working there. Um, so raise your hand if you know anything about the International Institute, if you've heard about it. OK, a few. And raise your hand if you know about the Festival of Nations. OK, a few more. Anyone know that the International Institute runs the Festival of Nations? All right. And do you know that it's this weekend? Yeah. All right. So I picked this date because it was not going to be snowing, and it's not. But it is the Festival of Nations this weekend. So, um, so the project that I proposed to my supervisor was I can't do this by myself. So I proposed to be able to supervise interns who would do the research. I was teaching full time. On um, my quarter breaks, I did some of the research as well. So from 2013 to 2016, I had 21 interns researching here in the International Institute records at the Immigration History Research Center archives um, here in Anderson Library. And one went to um, Minnesota Historical Society. There's things there as well. In spring of 2017, this beautiful woman fell from the sky, Zornitsa Kermichieva. Raise your hand. She's here now, but she was at McAllister. And it's just amazing circumstance that we connected. Um, she offered to do this class where the students in the class would do immigration history research on the history of immigration policy to America, immigrants to Minnesota, and then help me tell the story of the institute. So all the materials that the first round of interns did, that was phase one, then her students, 14 students, culled through that and pulled out the key facts. Um, and they created a digital timeline, which is really, really helpful for this project. Um, then. Um, Throughout that time, Daniel Nietzsche from the uh, archives here just was wonderful about answering my emails, setting up the orientation for the new students. I couldn't come and do that. So all of that time, and then uh, um, Daniel and Ellen uh, liked the idea of this uh, project becoming an exhibit that would be shown here and also at Ramsey County Historical Society. Um, Paul Shadowald from McAllister was just great facilitating that partnership. Then I left the Institute in 2016, and I'm teaching back in St. Paul Public Schools. Um, but I had a research fellowship from um, the Minnesota Historical Society. There was a little piece of the story that I thought was very fascinating. 
about Japanese American resettlement during World War II. Those papers are at MHS, but the story, we found out about it here. Um, so I did that work and then I, uh, I approached the Japanese American Citizen League asking if they would be willing to help me on my project. And they said, sure, but would you help us on our project? We have an <laughs> exhibit that's going to be at Fort Snelling. Um, that was last summer. And I met uh, wonderful people who shared their stories with me and pictures. So I'm going to focus on that today because I have pictures to share. Otherwise, I would be showing you pictures of documents. And then um, last summer, I had a student worker that McAllister paid, and they had fellowship money, and she helped me finish this up. Um, and then I had one more grant from the history, um, Minnesota Historical Society last summer um, um, through the International Institute to finish up the research. So here are the 22 uh, interns. We researched in 121 boxes in the institute collection. There's 179 total. And the rest that we didn't go into are case files that are closed um, and that's private information. But I highlighted the seven that have a U of M connection. And one was a recent grad, but the rest were current students at the U of M. Um, so they just did a pile of work and it was a lot of work that they did. And then here's our McAllister class. So I'm in the red sweater and Zernitza's next to me and on the, behind us are uh, one of the librarians and Paul Shadowald. And so those 14 wonderful students who again culled through all of these notes and pulled out the key facts. And it was a huge project. They had foundation money to do a digital <coughs> project. Um, and then down on the right, that's Jane Groutman, who's the current executive director at the Institute. They came for the final party. Okay, so the International Institutes were started in New York City. We're not the only one. There were 55 at its uh, height. Um, they were started in 1911 by Edith Terry Bremer. Her photo is here in the Institute records. And the Institute here in St. Paul started in 1919. So you may know that we just had the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And it was already a city that had a lot of people that hadn't gotten their citizenship yet. Um, the institutes were started through the YWCA's. They served single women, YMCA's served single men. So the institutes were going to serve the foreign born women, but women brought their husbands and their children and they ended up serving families. Um, they offered English classes and citizenship classes, casework services, and activities for St. Paul's uh, ethnic communities. In 1938, the institute separated from the Y just on paper and financially they could get um, grant money and other uh, foundation money. Um, even back then, that's how it was done. Um, but they stayed housed with the Y until 1946 and then got their own building. The institute has continued in a variety of ways to help the foreign born adjust to American life while retaining their cultural heritage. Here's the women of the International Institute. So in 100 years, 13 executive directors, 10 have been women. The early records, I have the question marks <laughs> there. Um, it's my speculation of what their dates were. Before 1938, all the papers are at Smith College in the YWCA papers because they separate in 38. Um, and Zornitza, our connection was that she had done research in that collection um, in, at Smith College. So um, anyways, that was uh, why I don't have uh, true dates on that. But I'm going to focus on Alice Sickles uh, to tell you about her. I can't do all of these wonderful women, but there they are. So at the Institute itself, we found a copy of the 1921 annual report. And it looks just like annual reports do now. There's statistics. There's quotes from clients. Um, there's impact statements and outcomes. So the 1921 staff of four caseworkers spoke German, Italian, Norwegian, and Polish and served people from 13 countries. Those were the foreign born living in St. Paul at that time, those new uh, immigrants. The Institute services helped new Americans overcome barriers such as learning English, becoming citizens, and finding jobs. Caseworkers took people to appointments and made home visits. The Institute's cultural programs helped connect new and old stock Americans to share similarities and celebrate differences. There was a whole movement of Americanization going on and the YMCA was drinking that Kool-Aid and the YWCA was not. They said, no, we need to celebrate, not assimilate. Um, so you see a beautiful picture that we found at the Institute of an event that is taking place outside the downtown St. Paul Library. So here's Alice Sickles. And again, I don't have a lot of information from her from the records here. She's in all of the papers. But to get her story, I had to go onto the census records and then look up her obituary. So she was born in Spokane 
Washington, and her father was from Sweden, and her mother was from Vasa in Minnesota, which is a Swedish community. She has her BA from Whitman College. Her daughter, Barbara, was born in 1920. She got a master's degree in social work from the University of Minnesota in 1938. She was working full time and going to school just like so many uh, women do now. But I don't know about 1938, how common that was. Her husband died in 1940, and on the census, she's listed as a widow and the executive sec social worker for the community chest. So that is interesting to me because she was um, not working for the community chest. She was working for the International Institute, which was part of the Y, but they were funded by the community chest. So I can see her talking to the census worker and them just sort of like, okay, I'm going to write community chest. The community chest is now the United Way, and they still fund the International Institute. I love this census, the 1940 census. It's such a great census. You have so much information. She worked 60 hours for the week of March 24th to 30th in 1930. She worked for a $2,600 annual salary and paid rent on her home of $50 a month. Her daughter was in school at the time, and she had a servant. She had a woman living in her household who was from Wyoming. So Alice Sickles is famous for starting the Festival of Nations. It was her idea to start one here in 1932, but it wasn't her idea. They were happening at the other international institutes. The first one was in New York City. Um, there's an institute in Milwaukee and St. Louis that still have Festival of Nations. There are seven organizations still called the International Institute, and they all do Festival of Nations. So um, the first one was called a Homelands Exhibit. It was held in the YWCA Auditorium. The second one was held outside at Como Park, and it almost rained, so Alice Sickles said never again. <laughs> and then the third one was held at the St. Paul Civic Auditorium, and the YWCA was on 5th at the corner where um, St. Paul Companies is now, so there's the Landmark Center and the Ordway. Where the Ordway is, that's where the Civic Auditorium was, so it was across the street. Um, and so the first one was held there in 34, and then the 36th event was the first to be called the Festival of Nations. And here is that beautiful program from the first Festival of Nations. So in 1938, the Institute separated, again, on paper. They stayed in the YWCA building. Um, the Articles of Incorporation are here in box one, Administrative Records. And so this is an institutional history. So to read those Articles of Incorporation is, is fascinating for me, but I'll spare you all the details. Um, but it was nice for me to see her original um, signature on the documents. So there's a nice collection of, of beautiful old pictures here from the Festival of Nations. And if you're interested in cultural groups, this is a great collection to work in. Um, these pictures are uh, in box 12 here in our records. And the um, 1939 festival was um, the first one where they really seemed to really get how they could um, make these beautiful exhibits and have the food, and have the dancing, and have all of those things. And I compare those now, a lot of what you see now does not look as beautiful as what you see in those early days in the 30s. And the crowd is still the same. This is what you're going to see. You're going to see the crowd of people getting the food from all the different countries, listening to beautiful ethnic music, and going to sit down and watch dancing. So that is still what you will see. So the world changed on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese Imperial Air Force attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. I can't tell you this history, but please do learn about this if you don't. The fear and persecution of the Japanese and Japanese Americans on the West Coast caused a series of uh, executive orders to be signed. And it's very eerie and very scary to think about what happened. Um, the War Relocation Authority was put in place in March and it set in place the order to remove the Japanese and Japanese Americans who were living on the West Coast. The three states of the West Coast became a war zone, and these people were removed into internment camps or concentration camps, if you will, by the U.S. military. Here is one of them in Min uh, Minidoka Camp in Hunt, Idaho. They were hastily constructed. They weren't well insulated. People had very small quarters. They left with what they could carry. And many people lost everything. They lost their homes, their jobs, all their possessions. Um, it was a very tragic part of our history. But the story that I found was really amazing about how the International Institutes came to be involved in resettling these people. Nationwide, there are 55. 
international institutes, only 35 committees were formed. So there were communities that said, we can't do this in our community, even back then. So in October, the meeting of the people um, that were there were um, institute people, community people, and I want to highlight two. One, a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Earl Tanbara. They were the first resettled Japanese Americans. They came in August. They did not have to go to the camps. They had a unique story about how that came to be. But they came and volunteered to be a part of this committee. And the U of M connection is Mrs. Blagan, um, who was the wife of Dean of the Graduate School. And then I want to point out um, Reverend Sidney Powell. He was a Baptist church um, reverend. There's three reverends that came to this first meeting. So the story that we found in the archives, Heidi Anderson was researching in the box uh, 13 and found the letters from some of the people in the camps asking for help to get out. This letter is from Sugababa. She was in the camp at Topaz, Utah. She was from San Francisco and asking for help to get out. She did not get out. She was born in Japan. And very few people who were born in Japan got out. It was the Japanese Americans who were able to be resettled. So again, the story here is that everything that was happening was in the minutes. All the different boxes of the institute uh, records has the minutes of the committees and the reports of the committees. They had a newsletter called Nationality News, and this was a committee of the institute, the Japanese American Resettlement Committee. So in 1943, a year later, um, the committee is under the leadership of Mrs. Ward L. Beebe, that is Bess Luthel Beebe. She was the first board of directors president in 1919. So here we are in 1943, she is still involved, and it's all volunteer. Um, so this committee has been cooperating with the federal government in the relocation of American citizens of Japanese ancestry removed by the Army from their Pacific Coast homes. It has been greatly encouraged by the fine reception which the evacuees have had in St. Paul. About 150 have been resettled in St. Paul. So just a year later, um, I should point out there was a Japanese uh, resettlement committee in Minneapolis. <laughs> Don't want to not uh, count them, um, but they weren't involved with the institute. And um, total, we think about 1,500 people were resettled in St. Paul and Minneapolis. Nationwide, only 35,000 of those 110,000 people were resettled before the war ended. So the war ended in uh, Europe in May of 45. We're coming up on that anniversary. And in August of 45, the war ended, of course, very tragically in Japan. So the committee had been operating for three years. They were helping people on a case-by-case -case basis, asking people to take someone into their home and help them find a job. Well, with the war ending and all the soldiers coming home, they knew there was going to be an even harder time trying to find housing. So this building no longer exists. This is on Kellogg. Upstairs was already a residential hotel. Just right next door was the building where the International Institute moved to um, on Kellogg. So it's where the River Center is now, where the Festival of Nations is being held. Um, they signed a lease for three years to turn this into a short-term hostel. Warren Berger was the legal counsel on this committee. He is a man. I'm highlighting him for a, a minute here. Um, he became Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. So I think that's really great that he was involved in this committee. And he hired a Japanese-American uh, secretary, Kimi Yanari, to work in his office. So here's the committee in 45, the people that were involved. Mrs. Woodard Colby, that's Ruth Gage Colby. She became a, a really key figure. She helped people find jobs. Um, Warren Berger, of course. Um, Miss Elizabeth Evans was a Presbyterian missionary who had been in Japan, and she purposely went to live in the camp at Granada to be a missionary there as well. They hired Mrs. Tomiko Ogata, who was a Japanese woman who was resettled to St. Paul to be the dietitian. She was cooking Japanese food for the people in the hostel. And then on the right, the committee officers, those are the people from the institute. Um, Mrs. Elliot McGraw is Martha McGraw, Bess Luthel Beebe. Um, and then uh, Mr. William Powell, I don't know if he's related to uh, the Reverend Sidney Powell, but he was on that committee from the Baptist Church. Ms. Eloise Tanner now is the executive secretary of the institute, and she is on this committee as well. So Alice Sickles left the institute in 1944. In 1945, here we have her signing copies of her new book, Around the World in St. Paul, published by the University of Minnesota Press. I love her hat. Isn't that just a beautiful <laughs> picture? So they had a folk arts festival where she was signing her books. And she also left to become the executive director of the new International Institute in Detroit. And she was there until 1959. 
So here's her book. Lots of people uh, asked me as I was doing my project, have you read this book? Oh, yes. There are original copies of this book at the Institute in boxes. Um, so she had a fellowship for her project, and it was published also with some foundation money here at the U of M Press. Now, of course, it's out of print. So again, the wraparound of you know, the, the papers that I had uh, researched here and the papers at MHS, and then I connected with people in the community to get the pictures. So that's why I have some nice pictures to show you. So the membership council meeting minutes from 1947 talks about um, Mrs. Tanbara being on that committee. So that's Ruth Tanbara, who came to Minnesota in August of 42. She was hired by the YWCA, but just jumped into the institute and was very involved in the institute. And then in 1947, there's a list of the cultural groups that are meeting at the institute, and one of them is the Neisei. The Neisei is the second generation of Japanese Americans. Um, we might say first generation, they're the first ones born here. But Japanese culture thinks of the Issei as the first generation. They're the immigrants to come. So in this picture, which was shared with me by Linda Hashimoto van Doivert, is her mother. Second from the right is Haruko, her mom. She was also hired by the YWCA and they're in the Neisei Girls Club, which was being held, uh, having a dinner in 1946 at the Y. So I got so lucky to be able to meet um, Ruth Tambara and Earl Tambara's niece and nephew, and Judy shared these pictures with me. Um, this is the 1947 Festival of Nations. So what we see is a pattern when a new culture comes, they get connected with the Institute, and then eventually they show up at the festival. And so the festival started with 13 cultural groups and gr has grown over time. So here's the Festival of Nations in 1947, and Ruth Tambar is behind the food table there in the black with white. And then you see little Judy down there with her auntie. And then they're in the exhibit booth here. So um, Judy Nomer is here today, and I just am so grateful to have made these connections to hear the personal stories and get the pictures. Because again, when you're reading in documents, when you meet someone who this is their story, and then they have the pictures, it just all comes full circle and comes to life. So um, this was how the festivals were done back then. Now they look a little bit different, but very, very similar of the food booths and the exhibit booths. So the 1949 program is here in box 61, and this is a treasure trove of information if you're looking for information about ethnic communities. So it was the Territorial Centennial. This program is a book, and everything that you can find in here would be interesting if you're interested in cultural groups. So the committees wrote a story of their culture coming to Minnesota, and they picked a key person in the culture, and then there's listed everybody who participated. So I pulled out a few names that I now uh, recognize. So the general chairman of this group was Mrs. Earl Tambara. That was Ruth Tambara. The market chairman is Mrs. Ogata. That's Tomiko Ogata from the hostel, the dietitian. The exhibit chairs are Mrs. Howard Nomura. Howard Nomura was Ruth's brother. It's Judy's dad and mom. Um, and Mrs. Haruko Hashimoto. That's Linda's mom. And Haruko wor worked with Ruth at the Y. And the dance instructor is Mrs. Haruko Hashimoto. So again, if you're looking for who are the leaders in these communities, this document uh, is a really helpful document. One more quick thing about Ruth. Um, she was working as a, um, she was a home, econom home economist, sorry. She had a degree from Oregon State. She was working full time at the Y. She went back to school and got her master's in home economics here at the U. Sadly, that program no longer exists, but she's another U of M alum. She lived Hmm? She, lived to be she lived to be 100, yeah. She died in January, um, and she was a community leader for her whole life. Okay, so again, I just have to share this beautiful picture with you. So Linda Hashimoto's mom, Haruko, was the dance instructor in 1949. In the 1958 festival, her three children were dancers in the festival. So these children grew up attending the festival. Linda is there on the left. And she says, oh, look at my big cheeks. It's so <laughs> cute. I just love that picture. So the collection here actually starts in 1973. The box uh, 61 through 74 of the festival materials is from 73 to 95. So that 1949 is kind of an anomaly um, and was really lucky to find that. But so 1973 was the 15th Festival of Nations. They had been about every three years. Um, with some breaks in the middle, and one of the breaks was that where the institute was on Kellogg, the city took that 
over with eminent domain and tore it all down to build the St. Paul Civic Center. So this has the picture of the artist rendering, but the festival in 1973 was the first event to be held at the St. Paul Civic Center, which is also no longer there. <laughs> That's where the Excel Energy Center is now. But we have grown now to 34 cultural groups participating in the festival. And again with the photos, here we have Linda Hashimoto dancing in the festival. So she grew up with her mom being the dance instructor, and now she's the dance instructor, and she is there today and this whole weekend, and she is leading the Japanese group um, in dancing. And then Ruth and Earl Tanbara are there at the 1973 festival. They are still involved as well. So then in that collection of, of the documents of the festival, you can see not anymore the names of everybody involved. That doesn't happen anymore. But you can see who are the new cultural groups. So 1980 was the Festival of Nations where the Hmong first participated. They came in 1975 with the Vietnamese and the Cambodians um, to settle in our community. And of course, Hmong, Laotians, Pakistanis, Taiwanese, Spanish, and Welsh were new community groups that participated in that 1980 festival. So again, the, the boxes are box 61 to 74, and that collection shows the festival materials from 73 to 95. So one more thing about Ruth. Um, in the board, committee, and correspondence uh, box, you look for things that you're looking for. You may not find them, but sometimes things just pop out. And there was a letter from Ruth Tambara to the Institute congratulating them on their 75th anniversary. She thanked the Institute for its support of Japanese Americans in the 1930s and 40s. And she said the International Institute of Minnesota was one of the first agencies to welcome the Japanese Americans, US citizens by birth. And she gives a contribution from her redress payment from the US government for the evacuation. In 1988, the US government did formally apologize. Ronald Reagan uh, formally apologized. And the people who were uh, still alive who had been evacuated from the West Coast, had been interned, had a financial contribution, or not contribution, um, what would you say? Uh, they got money. In, <laughs> there we go. Remuneration, thank you. This is why you don't wing it, because you might <laughs> not get the right word. Um, so I just think that's a testament to how important uh, Ruth felt like the International Institute was to herself and to the community. And again, in 1994, she had had some time to think about where she wanted this money to go, and some she gave to the Institute. So the Institute is 100 years old this year. They have a legacy of making a difference in the community. The cultures are different. The languages are different. The religions are different. But the Institute is still helping new Americans achieve self-sufficiency and full membership in American life. The Institute supports this mission by providing linguistically and culturally accessible services that enable every new American to work toward achieving full community participation and self-sufficiency since 1919. The Festival of Nations is still going strong. It's happening this weekend. You can go tonight starting at 3 o'clock. The kids were there yesterday and today. It's the longest running multicultural festival in the Midwest. Since 1932, it's grown from 13 cultural groups to 90. Now 1,000 volunteers and 50,000 attendees. But I want to point out, it is a fundraising event. When you buy the $13 ticket, that is supporting the work of the Institute. And when you buy something from the food booth or the marketplace booth, you're supporting a nonprofit group that is a cultural group. So the Japanese American Citizens League run the market, and the St. Paul Nagasaki Sister City group runs the food booth. And then the International Institute is telling its story in an exhibit that was a partnership with the International Institute, Ramsey County Historical Society, and the Immigration History Research Center Archives. It's on view right now at the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Landmark Center in downtown St. Paul. It will be here in October, um, here in the second and third floor atrium. And it was designed by Darren Terpstra, who did the beautiful ABC of it exhibit, so you know it will look just beautiful. And then my work, which is you know, really all of these people's work, I'm just like the collator of the story. I wrote an article for Ramsey County History Magazine, which I think is coming out next week, on the 100-year story of the Institute. And then the grant um, supported me to write two Minipedia articles, one on the Institute and one on the festival. The Institute is up, and the festival one just came up, uh, yes, no, two days ago. So it's a Minnesota online encyclopedia. It's very fun. You can check it out, and it all links up together. So thank you very much for being here to hear this history. 
again, it was a huge project, five years, lots of people working on it. My actual thanks document is two pages of all the people that helped on it, uh, lots of organizations, and again, the, um, the archives are here. The Immigration History Research Center Archives has 179 boxes of material. So thank you very much. Our second presentation today is Charged with Assault for Spitting and Other Harrowing Tales, Remembering the Trials of Madeline Rodriguez, Suzanne Goodwin, and Cindy Potate, presented by Rachel Matson, curator of the Treader Collection in GLBT Studies. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion as we look back on the last half decade in LGBTQ histories. What stories do we tend to remember and what stories do we forget? Hi, everybody. Um, so, uh, I'm going to try to be on time here today. Um, I just uh, want to thank the committee for organizing all the work they did to organize this event and for all of you guys for showing up. Um, so, if you saw the announcement for my talk uh, in advance of today, you would have seen a very different title and subject for my talk. I proposed that talk in September and I was brand new here, so I really had no idea what I was going to talk about and I ended up changing my mind. So um, I'm just really happy to be here and um, well, I'm going to talk about some women, some stories from the Treader Collection. Um, as you probably know, this year, 2019, marks 50 years since the year 1969. Um, I wasn't alive in 1969, but I've read about it. Um, <laughs> and I know that for a lot of people, 1969 felt like a pivot, a portal to another world. The previous year had been an intense one. In the spring of 1968, both Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated, um, which set off wildcat rioting, rioting in a long list of cities and generating a sort of nationwide sense of despair. And by the time 1969 arrived, Many people were feeling like the world was spinning in rapid rotation, and events of that year um, continued to turn up the heat on that feeling. So for instance, in 1969, the journalist Seymour Hirsch broke the story of the illegal massacre of women and children in um, My Lai, Vietnam, and the 21-year-old Black Panther Fred Hampton was murdered in his bed by Chicago police, and the Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Um, also in 1969, the Woodstock Music Festival happened, and Sesame Street premiered, and Aretha Franklin won a Grammy for her song, Chain of Fools. And here in the Twin Cities, 1969 was also the year when African-American students um, at the university occupied the campus administration building to demand a range of changes in the way the university treated African-American students and histories. 1969 was also an important year in LGBTQ histories. In the spring of 1969, a small group of folks gathered in the Cedar Riverside section of Minneapolis here um, to establish a gay liberation organization that they would, they would come to call Fight Repression of Erotic Expression, or FREE, um, for short. And several weeks after that, patrons at a gay bar in New York City <laughs> famously resisted a raid by local police, launching what would come to be called the Stonewall Rebellion. So for someone who works in the LGBTQ archive, like I do, um, these anniversaries are very hard to ignore. Um, various individuals and groups are endeavoring to mark these anniversaries with exhibits and roundtables and essays and books and other kinds of retrospective commemorations. And they frequently wish to use archival materials in these efforts. And indeed, the Trader Collection itself um, is hosting an exhibit to mark the 50th anniversary of the founding of Free upstairs in this building um, starting in June, which are all invited to come back to see. Um, and so as I've fielded requests over the past few months to participate in panel discussions and to give presentations and to be interviewed by journalists and to facilitate the contribution of art archival artifacts to exhibits and publications, I've begun to think a lot about what it means to celebrate the 50-year anniversary of something like the Stonewall Rebellion or Free. And just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm very curious and thinking a lot about just what exactly we think we're commemorating in this moment 
And to what purpose do we wish to put this act of remembering? There are some who wish to mark this anniversary with a straightforward celebration of the achievements of the past half century, to use this as benchmark to tell a simple story about the ways in which LGBTQ people are more free than we were in 1969. And it's certainly true that a great many things have changed for LGBTQ people um, in the five decades since 1969. Pick any decade, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s. Each one brought with them um, new, challenge, uh, new activist organizations, new legal rights, new works of art, as well as new challenges, new ways to die, and new ideas about what it means to be free. But the truth is that the past is not a linear story of interrupted progress. And Stonewall was not the beginning of LGBTQ struggles for justice, and likewise, the struggle for justice for LGBTQ people is far from over. And the more I think about it, the more convinced I am that for me, the point of this anniversary is that it offers the opportunity for reflection about both the victories and the failures, the high points and the heartbreak of the past 50 years. And to ask questions not just about what we remember, but also about what, and about what we forget, what we have forgotten. Sometimes it seems to me that all the celebratory music drowns out the history of activist failures and the real risks that the poorest and most vulnerable LGBTQ people are facing today. The CDC, for instance, recently estimated that if current rates continue, one in two African-American gay or bisexual men will be infected with HIV in their lifetime. That's 50% of all African-American men. Um, compare that to infection rates for white, gay, and bisexual men, which is one in 11, or just 9%. And um, LGBTQ women, meanwhile, face disproportionate levels of violence, poverty, and incarceration. Although they make up less than 3% of the general population, LGBTQ, people, uh, LGBTQ women comprise over 42% of the women's prison population, and more than half of all LGBTQ homicide victims are transgender women of color. So I could go on, there's many more statistics I could, I could quote, um, but I think you get the point. When we uncritically celebrate victories in the struggle for LGBTQ rights and freedoms, we risk overlooking the very real inequalities that divide the so-called LGBTQ community today. And the ways in which poverty, racism, transphobia, AIDS phobia, and homophobia continue to endanger the most vulnerable queer and trans people and uncritical celebrations also risk obscuring a wide range of stories about what actually happened over the past 50 years. Stories and events that, although possibly forgotten, continue to shape our present. So, getting to the meat of the presentation, um, in the spirit of marking this 50 year anniversary by remembering overlooked stories, I'd like to resurrect today a set of forgotten histories from the early years of the AIDS epidemic. At the center of these stories are three women, two from Minnesota and one from North Dakota, whose lives are partially documented in the collections held at the Trotter Collection for GLBT Studies here at the University of Minnesota. Their names are Madeline Rodriguez, Suzanne Goodwin, and Cindy Poteet. As far as I know, none of these women actually knew each other, but they did have a few things in common. As I said, all three of them lived in the upper Midwest, Rodriguez and Goodwin in the Twin Cities and Poteet in Fargo. All three of them came into contact with the criminal justice system in the late 1980s and early 1990s. At the time of their arrest, all three of them were HIV positive. And um, all three of them were arrested and charged with some version of the same crime. That is, the crime of harboring an infectious agent and engaging in activity that could transfer that disease to another person. So I'll start with Madeline Rodriguez's story. In truth, I don't know a lot about Madeline Rodriguez, um, but I do know that on December 1st, 1989, this 36-year-old was in her apartment in South Minneapolis um, having an argument with her son. The noise of this disturbance caught the attention of her neighbors, and someone called the police. And when they arrived, the officers entered Rodriguez's apartment and attempted to restrain Rodriguez's son, um, causing a scuffle. And what happened next is in some dispute. Um, the official complaint issued by the arresting officer claimed that Madeline Rodriguez spit in his face while screaming, I have AIDS and I hope you get it and die. Rodriguez herself told a different story. She said that while attempting to restrain her son, one of the officers struck her in the face with a billy club, 
causing her to bleed, at which point she informed the officers that she was HIV positive. Whatever the case, as soon as the officers learned that Rodriguez was HIV positive, they shifted their attention from Rodriguez's son to Rodriguez herself. They arrested her and they charged her with attempted assault with the, quote, deadly weapon of, quote, saliva and blood containing the HIV virus. They would later raise the charges to attempted murder and only re re released her when she had posted $10,000 bond. So four days after Rodriguez's arrest, the Star Tribune published an item under the heading, Woman Charged with Assault for Spitting. Test shows she has HIV virus. The article's author, Jill Hodges, noted that this was one of the first cases brought under Minnesota's law, making it a crime for someone who knows they're HIV positive to engage in conduct that might transfer the virus to another person. The only other case reported, um, reportedly that had happened um, under this law previously um, was of a federal prisoner with the AIDS virus who was convicted of biting two prison guards at the Federal Medical Center in Rochester, Minnesota in 1987. And a few days after Rodriguez's arrest, after this Star Tribune um, piece had come out, the local chapter of the grassroots group ACT UP issued a press release condemning the handling of this case. Quote, ACT UP Minnesota is outraged and alarmed at this kind of injustice to a person with HIV infection. Um, this is what the press release said. Um, and they continued, the exaggerated level of charges against Ms. Rodriguez are proof that AIDS hysteria, sexism, racism, and homophobia are rampant in the Minneapolis Police Department and at the county attorney's office. Around, so around the same time, the, um, the other organization, the, another organization um, locally, the Minnesota AIDS Project, also issued a press release. And um, in, in that press release, the group's CEO expressed his sadness mm -hmm. about the case and issued a reminder that, quote, AIDS is not spread by spitting or biting. Despite these interventions and despite Rodriguez's own claims of innocence, she was ultimately found guilty of assault and sentenced to six days in jail and five years probation. So if Rodriguez's version of the events are true, that means that in 1990, a Minnesota woman was convicted of assault for the crime of being hit, in the, hit with a billy club by a police officer who incidentally was supposed to be protecting her from domestic violence in her home, um, and then alerting the officer to the fact that she had HIV. Um, but even if the virgin, version of events recounted by the police is correct, the end result was that Rodriguez served a sentence of five years probation just for the so-called crime of spitting in the direction of a police officer, an act which was known even in 1989 to carry no real risk of transmitting the virus. In any event, it seems clear that Rodriguez's arrest under this law was marked by a combination of racism, poverty, police misconduct, and what ACT UP would call AIDS hysteria. I first learned of Rodriguez's case from a set of files contained at the, in the Treasure Collection, um, the papers of Twin City activist Robert Halfhill, who will come up in a, in a little bit later as well. Um, and uh, his papers are one of the collections we hold at the Treader. Documents pertaining to Rodriguez's case sit in a box among a dozen other files documenting Act, Up's, Act Up Minnesota's advocacy on behalf of a wide range of LGBTQ and HIV positive people who came into contact with the criminal justice system in the years between 1989 and 2000. Among the other cases documented in the files are those of Suzanne Goodwin and Cindy Poteet. So I, again, I can't tell you very much about Suzanne Goodwin, apart from the fact that she was 28 years old at the time of her arrest, and that she was, as a flyer created by the Suzanne Goodwin Defense Committee later put it, a Native American woman from White Earth. Her arrest took place in 1991 in a bowling alley in Shakopee. Police, arrested, uh, police accused her of attacking four male patrons um, and then biting two people, including a Scott County Sheriff's deputy. Goodwin disputed this account, saying that in fact she was attacked, she was beaten and choked by four white men after the wife of one of the assailants told her to go back to the reservation and she had responded with, why don't you go back to Europe? She was charged. <laughs> All right, that's a laugh line, I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> she was charged and ultimately convicted by an all-white jury of felony assault, disorderly conduct, and obstructing justice. Um, and again, ACT UP Minnesota began to agitate on her behalf, protesting both the Scott County Sheriff's use of forcible HIV testing and the discriminatory overtones of her arrest and conviction. In a letter they sent to the prosecuting attorney, they um, asked that Goodwin's conviction be overturned and that the state acknowledge that in fact she was the true victim and that they should pay her compensation. Of course, the prosecuting attorney declined to honor either of these requests. 
Um, and as in Madeline Rodriguez's case, Goodwin's case offers an example of a moment when a combination of racism, sexism, AIDS hysteria came together to re-victimize someone who herself had most likely been the victim of physical assault. And even if the sheriff's deputy's version of events were true, and to be honest, I find it very hard to think that one woman could really go up against five people um, in any real way, this case is marked by a long list of questionable elements, including a th through current of obvious discrimination. So finally, Cindy Poteet. At the time of her arrest in 1995, Cindy Poteet was living in Fargo, North Dakota. She was an AIDS educator who had co-created an award-winning rural AIDS education project. She was also struggling with addiction and on parole at the time of her arrest. And what happened was this. One night, she fell off the wagon. She got blackout drunk at a bar called the Bismarck Tavern. And then two days later, she woke up half naked in the back of a van of a man who'd been her boss at one point previously. She was subsequently placed under arrest for violating her parole by drinking. Um, and when the arresting officer discovered that HIV, uh, that, that Poti was HIV positive, um, he further charged her with attempted murder under North Dakota's law that criminalized the transmission of AIDS. She thereby became the first person in North Dakota to be accused of attempted murder with what one reporter later called the singular and controversial weapon of HIV. In the end, the attempted murder charges were dismissed when the man who was alleged to have had sex with her, admitted in court that he and Poteet had not had sex, um, that he had just, when he was arrested for drunk driving, he had told the police that they'd had sex because he was trying to brag. Um, nonetheless, Poteet was convicted on two counts of probation violations since one of the conditions of her probation was that she not drink. Um, and she was sentenced to six months in the Bismarck State Penitentiary. Like in Rodriguez's and Goodwin's cases, ACT UP Minnesota sprang to action on Poteet's behalf. And in a post-conviction letter they sent to the North Dakota governor, the group begged for clemency, noting that prisons are not equipped to dispense the complicated medical care that people with AIDS require, that Poteet was a mother, and that her t detention placed three, her three young children at risk of um, homelessness and destitution. And the letter ends with an impassioned piece, an impassioned first person paragraph authored by Robert Halfhill, who was a member of ACT UP Minnesota, um, about the injustice of Poteet's situation. Halfhill wrote, I thought that I had heard everything when I was first contacted about Miss Poteet's case and realized that a woman had been raped and the legal authorities were trying to send the woman to prison for what would be the rest of her life while letting her rapist go scot free. But now I learn that the welfare department denied her children any help because Poteet did not keep her appointment in person, which she was prevented from doing because by that time she had been incarcerated. As a result, Halfhill explained, there is a high possibility that both she and her children will be homeless by the time she gets out of prison. In the end, Poteet did serve her six-month sentence, um, and when shortly after she was released, she was interviewed by, for a profile in the national magazine called Paws. Um, she tried to be upbeat, but she couldn't hide the effect that being publicly accused of attempted murder by HIV had had on her life. It ruined everything, she said, everything good in my life. So at a moment of extreme vulnerability when she needed medical attention and counseling and care, Poteet was instead treated um, to an overzealous criminal prosecution and thrust into a media limelight. Just as with Rodriguez's and Goodwin's account encounters with the criminal justice system, Poteet's case demonstrates the ways in which AIDS hysteria laid the way for a riot of injustice to take place under the banner of law and order, and how easy it was for the state to use HIV criminalization against the most vulnerable of individuals. These stories might seem like they're vestiges of another time, tragic mistakes that happened in a moment of fear and panic, but impossible in our current moment. But the truth is, this is not the case. 26 states, including Minnesota and North Dakota, still have laws that criminalize HIV exposure on the books. In Minnesota, the law was used to convict someone of first degree assault as recently as 2014. And there are still people serving time for violating HIV criminalization laws in states all across the US. I don't know if you can see that cartoon. HIV criminalization laws were written in the early years of the AIDS epidemic when a concoction of homophobia and popular misunderstandings of how the virus was transmitted led to a series of pr proposals designed to criminalize or even quarantine HIV positive people. In effect, they were just one outcome of a wave of AIDS hysteria. And when initially proposed, these laws were championed by 
um, those who propose them, as offering important protection for the vulnerable, especially victims of rape and assault. But as the experiences of Madeline Rodriguez, Cindy Poteet, and Suzanne Goodwin suggest, in practice, they're often used to the opposite effect, not to protect the vulnerable, but instead to target them. These laws have evolved over time, and they differ by state. Some states still criminalize spitting, even though we know for sure that transmission of HIV is unlikely, if not impossible, through such an act, to, to transmit through such an act. Um, several states require people to register as sex offenders um, as part of their punishment if they're convicted of this crime. Some states require criminal penalties for women who transmit, transmit HIV to a child during pregnancy or child feed, or breastfeeding. Um, but just as they were in Madeline Rodriguez, Suzanne Goodwin, and Cindy Poteet's times, police and prosecutors tend to use these laws to target the most vulnerable among us. Um, a recent report by the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law found that in one state, 95% of people charged with violating this law were sex workers. Two thirds of all people were black. Uh, two thirds of all people who were convicted under this law were black and Latino, or charged under this law were black and Latino, and that quote white men accused of HIV crime, HIV related crime, were significantly more likely to be released, and not charged. So the overlapping forces that shaped each of Rodriguez Goodwin's and Poteet's encounters with the criminal justice system: sexism, racism, poverty, sexual assault, prosecutorial overreach still have a, has a profound effect on how these laws are deployed. The good news is that recently activists have renewed efforts to contest these laws. One group doing this work calls itself the HIV is not a crime collective and they created this poster and the image from the previous slide as well. Um, and in the past few years several states have actually repealed the laws they passed in the late 80s and 1990s. So, I hope that as we move forward into the next 50 years, um, we can begin to tell more complicated stories about the past and the present um, and celebrate victories and expanded liberty alongside continuing inequality and injustice. Uh, and let's use this and future anniversaries to unearth some of the stories we've forgotten along the way and to shed light on the inequities that continue to endanger the lives of the most vulnerable members of the LGBTQ population, such as women, queer, trans people who suffer from poverty, racism, transphobia, and AIDS phobia, those who continue to have inadequate access to healthcare, and those who are too easily caught in the tentacles of the criminal justice system. And let's remember the trials of Madeline Rodriguez, Suzanne Goodwin, and Cindy Poteet, and use these histories to inform our work to make a more just future. Thanks. I think we have a minute or two for questions, if anyone has a question for one of our speakers. Yeah? Can you talk about the treasured collection, what that involves? Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about it? He just wants to hear a little bit more about the treasure collection. Yes, the treasure collection uh, for in the, it's officially called the, Treader, the Jean Nicholas Treader Collection in GLBT Studies. Uh, it's a collection here in the Anderson Library in the Archives and Special Collections that um, documents the lives of LGBTQ people, um, both in the upper Midwest and internationally. We have rare books, we have archival collections, papers and, of organizations and people from Minnesota and other places. Um, and um, I mean, I, I, is there a specific area that you're interested in knowing more about? Okay, great. I mean, tell me. It, it was um, originally created by a, a man, a local um, uh, Twin Cities resident named Jean, Jean Nicholas Treader, who was an avid collector, is still an avid collector, and who, who started collecting materials sort of right around the time of the Stonewall Rebellion, um, and uh, amassed an incredibly, um, a wonderful collection of material documenting LGBTQ histories, lives, periodicals, ephemera, um, papers, books, zines, um, and whatnot. 
and the collection came to the university in the year 2000 and has been here ever since and has been continued to be built and curated by a series of, of folks. Yeah, thanks. All right. Um, so we, so um, any other questions or? All right. Um, so we invite you to please uh, visit uh, the Sherlock Holmes room on the second floor if you haven't seen that. Um, it's in room 2514. Right, it's on the second floor. I can't remember the room number. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we also invite you to see the exhibit on the ground floor in the wall in the Maxine Wallen Center, room 15, calling to question 150 years of liberal arts education in the University of Minnesota, as well as the three floors um, of the atrium, the exhibit ABC of it, Why Children's Books Matter. Um, and once again, Maura will be leading a tour in the back, um, as well as if you'd like to go on a tour of the exhibit, uh, Mary will be, can meet you at the foot of the stairs in the atrium. Um, so this is our last month of the First Friday's presentations until next October. Each year we have a broad theme that speakers use as inspiration as we craft our presentations. So if you have an idea for a theme you would like to propose for next year's season, we, uh, we do have some slips at the back. We thought we'd solicit from the, our audience this time just to see if anyone had anything they would love to hear about. Um, and then I think before we take off, um, our ask director, Chris Kiesling, would like a quick word. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, as you mentioned, sadly, this is the last First Fridays for this year. And we want to thank you all for coming, and especially for those of you loyal attendees who are here every month for First Fridays. We're always happy to see you and welcome you back and welcome to the new attendees. We hope you'll come back. Um, I usually at the end of the First Friday season uh, thank all of our presenters who have uh, prepared talks, very interesting talks on a huge variety of topics and also to thank the First Fridays committee um, who puts this all together. They handle creating, uh, selecting the theme, lining up the presenters, handling the catering and the publicity and all that good stuff. So thanks very much to Caitlin Marino, Kate Dietrich, Amanda Wick, Linnea Anderson, and Rebecca Tuve. Um, they're usually the, the people standing out there by the uh, food, making sure that you all have what you need. Um, and they do just a terrific job, and so I'd like to acknowledge their work. We'll see you in October. <laughs>